Welcome to another episode of the Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Medicine podcast. And we've got um, Michael Hoffman here, who we've spoken to several times before. And Michael is um, the director of the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute, which is one of the world, if not the world's leading cancer institute. I think that's fair to say. It's absolutely leading in theranostics anyway. And uh, and uh, famous throughout the world for, for the wonderful work they've done in theranostics in particular. And um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit more today about um, about a couple of trials. Now, the number of trials, how many trials have you got going over there at the moment? Far too many. I think we, have, <laughs> uh, we have over 10 clinical trials uh, in prostate cancer imaging and theranostics yes. and many more trials in other cancer types as well. But prostate cancer has been my focus for the last a uh, few years, uh, so it keeps us very, very busy. Yeah, we well, love it. It's one of the most co- most common cancers, and the theranostics have been crazy successful. I think that would be fair to say, particularly in a um, a cancer that's uh, that's been stubborn uh, to treat, when, particularly when it gets metastatic, right? Um, in uh, in in other ways, um, and uh, I think one of the more exciting things is is the diversity of the stuff that you're doing over there. I mean, uh, you you try you're trying also a whole range of things. I mean, uh, as you remember, if you've been an avid listener to the podcast, that they did the first real big multi centre trial was was led uh, led from there, which was the led to the Lancet paper um, and the image of the year. Um, that was well, five years ago now, really, uh, two thousand and eighteen. Trying to think, our very first phase two trial was two, that was published in twenty eighteen, which yeah. was the first prospective trial of lutetium PSMA six one seven, right? And that was the beginning of a explosion. Uh, I think it generated a lot of interest. A lot which of is good, a lot of explosion, and it was done. It was done uh, with very little money and 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 uh, uh, very little support from industry. But of course, industry is now lining up to get involved. Correct. You know, you know Talix uh, was a little company, for example, with about three people in it a few years ago, and now it's a huge multinational company. So I think this is this, this indicates how how valuable it is. But we're, I, I was particularly intrigued. We were just at the ANZ SNM meeting, the Australian Nuclear Medicine meeting, and. Um, uh, and uh, and I was intrigued by by some of the um, uh, the diversity of the trials you were doing. In particular, you had I thought the Violet trial was something quite unique, something that hadn't been done. And and the I can never get my tongue around that lutectomy. That's trial. good, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> the lutectomy trial, which I thought was also super interesting. There's a whole lot of others too, but perhaps we can save them for another podcast. And there's a whole lot of other immune things and other things going on right in the link up. But but I just thought. We could start with those. Perhaps um, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from. I think everyone knows, but maybe give us a little bit of intro. Brief intro. I'm a nuclear medicine physician, uh, trained in Melbourne, spent a year in London, uh, have been at Peter Mac now for around 15 years. Uh, so focus shifted to cancer imaging and therapy. And I think I was fortunate to join Peter Mac at a time where there was a very large neuroendocrine tumour program using gallium-68, dotatate and lutetium uh, dotatate and uh, really learned some good fundamentals. Uh, and when PSMA came along in uh, around 10 years ago or so, we were able to transition very early to gallium PSMA for imaging and also lotation PSMA for therapy. And I think I focused on trying to do that a little bit like our oncologists do things in a more rigid way, in a prospective fashion, uh, with very good quality data collection, which is something that nuclear medicine has not done so well over the years. So we've had great innovations, uh, but we tend to just get on and either scan patients or treat them and then go back and look at the results. And uh, yeah, I think I found when our neuroendocrine tumor patients, I'd do that, submit them to medical oncology journals and they would be rejected. They would say, oh, that looks promising, but why don't you do a prospective trial? maybe even multi-centre and then resubmit it. Uh, So I kind of learnt that the evidence level that our medical oncologists were demanding was significantly higher than what we were doing in nuclear medicine. So when we introduced PSMA, the easy pathway would have been to just start treating patients or just start scanning patients. But we did it the hard way, which is for imaging. We did a 
study called the PROPSMA trial, which was a 300 patient imaging trial run at 10 sites around Australia, comparing PSMA to CT bone scan in a randomised design. That one was published in The Lancet in 2020, so not long ago, three years ago, and it yeah. just tipped over its 1,000th citation a few days ago, so I was very proud to see that. So I think if we do things to a higher level, we, might, we have a very high impact globally. Right. And uh, if we want to change patient care globally rather than individuals, then we need to produce these high-quality research. And the high-quality means that you've got to do rigid patient selection, you've got to do rigid measurement of everything you do, presumably? I think, as a summary, it means everything's pre-specified. It's right. very easy to do it, image 50 patients, treat 50 patients, then go back, look at all the images, look at all the clinical data and put a nice story together. Right. Uh, but it's much harder if you say the primary endpoint is accuracy, and this is exactly how we're going to define accuracy. Lock everything in before you start. Right. Go off and do it. You can't change your parameters. Right. And uh, you're kind of locked in, and everything's done in a blinded sort of fashion without the sort of investigator bias. So it is a kind of different way to, to do things. It's much right. more challenging, uh, but I think we get very clean data. Not necessarily better data, but more reliable data. And it's what our, both what our clinical colleagues demand, but also what our health technology assessment committees demand in order to get these funded and reimbursed. Right. right. That's that's the other point I was going to make, is that is that is that we've now got we've now got these reimbursed and and rapidly being reimbursed around the world, but a lot of that's on the back of data that's been done here, right? Yeah. Because because you actually took the time to show is it better? Is it superior? And the only real way to do that is to do a prospective study where you can't break the rules and you blind everything. Yeah. So I think what we've seen going forward with lutetium PSMA is definitely a game-changing treatment. We see some pretty spectacular responses. Uh, but by the same token, it's a very lethal disease. Some people think of prostate cancer as a more sort of slowly growing or indolent cancer that you die with rather than from, but the population we're dealing with here is a population of men with metastatic castration-resistant right. disease that have progressed after a few lines of standard therapies, and that's really a rapidly progressive lethal disease. So out of the 50 patients that we treated on our first trial, 49 died of prostate cancer right. despite lutetium treatment. Right. So despite the advance, we asked the question, how can we do better? Yeah. And that's either using it earlier, combining yep. it with other treatments, or changing our radionuclides around, right. which brings us to the two studies you mentioned. So maybe we'll start with the one you found difficult to pronounce. What, what was it called? <laughs> Lutectomy. Lutectomy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it's a take on a prostatectomy. So right. a prostatectomy is when a surgeon goes in and takes your prostate out. Right. Uh, so for this trial, we worked very closely with our surgical colleagues, right. Declan Murphy, who leads the uh, robotic surgery program out at Peter Mac. I'd also mention that he does a podcast as well. He does. He does a podcast called GUcast. Yes. Uh, so check out GUcast, all things genitourinary yeah, he oncology. Does it, he does it way higher quality than mine and way more regularly than mine. <laughs> uh, so the idea here is let's give a dose of lutetium prior to surgery. Oh. So in men that have very early disease yep. that we're aiming to cure, right? let's give a cycle or two of lutetium and then proceed to have your surgery. And this was a pretty radical idea. Uh, this came together as a grant proposal that we submitted to uh, Movember some years ago, probably back in 2016. Uh, I think it's fair to say it's the sort of trial that industry at the time or even now would not be interested in. Right. They'd go, oh, this is too radical, too high risk. Uh, uh, but is it really radical? I mean, we've given radiotherapy to people prior before surgery, haven't we? Yeah, oh. <laughs> it's not that radical, which is why we proposed this. <laughs> right, uh, but seriously, that's not, it's not rare to give radiotherapy before surgery to shrink the tumor before you do surgery, right? Absolutely. And, uh, and, you know, as a first trial, the primary endpoint was on safety. Right. Uh, is it safe? to yep. do this because yep. uh, you're taking a population of men who you're aiming to cure so you don't want any long-term side effects yep and there was concern from our surgical colleagues who are scared of radiation quite frankly because yep. if you irradiate a region with external beam 
and then operate on the patient, it's a bit of a disaster, can be a disaster. So you get a lot of fibrosis ah. surrounding the tumour and they go in and they're used to their nice, clean, soft tissue planes and they go in and everything's sticky ah. and yucky. And uh, so they were a bit fearful that giving lutetium may decrease their ability to operate. And we reassured them, no, this lutetium has a one millimetre path length. It's not like external beam. It's very targeted and you will not have a problem operating uh, afterwards. Uh, but we wanted to show that. So safety was sort of one of the key endpoints. But the main endpoint for that study was simply how much radiation dose can we get to the prostate cancer. Right. Uh, and we know external beam radiation is also a curative option for men with prostate cancers. You can kind of either have surgery or external beam and there's a big debate about which one's better and it varies between which country you're in. So here we wanted to show that if we take patients with prostate cancer, high risk, high PSMA expression, that we can give one or two cycles of lutetium PSMA and get very high doses of radiation to the prostate gland and that it'll be safe. Right. And uh, this is this is for, for, I mean, is this where it hasn't spread at all or? It may have spread to lymph nodes in the pelvis, right, right. but no distant metastasis. Right. Okay. Yeah, so we defined it as sort of an N1, which means you've got nodes in the pelvis, but M0, no metastases. You've had a PSMA PET scan and it shows an SCV max over 20, so high uptake, and you were healthy and fit, uh, then you could be included in this study. And we recruited 20 men for yep. this very small study, and we presented the results uh, recently at the European Urology Association meeting in Milan where Renu Epen, one of our urologists who's doing a PhD, uh, presented it in their game-changing session. So I got a big plenary talk. Yep. And it's under peer review at the moment. It's going through revisions in a journal. Right. That we're crossing our fingers well accepted. Right. So are there any sort of results apart from just... Uh, the... Yeah. So we did show that we could get good radiation to tumours. I yep. think the in cohort A, which was the first 10, the median dose to the prostate, uh, it was around 50 gray. Right. Uh, and uh, median dose to lymph nodes in patients that had nodal involvement was similar. Right. And we could see some early signs of efficacy because right. we repeated the PET scan before surgery. We could see the tumours shrinking significantly. Right. Uh, importantly, we had very, very little side effects. So this was really well tolerated. And the surgeons evaluated carefully whether they thought their surgery was more difficult to perform after lutetium and they found no, no difficulty. So this is really, let's say, a first-in-field study in this sort of newly diagnosed uh, state. It's not practice-changing because we it's a very small study, only 20 men. We can't really look at oncologic outcomes, although we had a couple of patients in that series that were that were pretty unwell, and uh, and we think you know we saw some pretty impressive responses. Oh. Uh, so we hope other groups will take this data and hopefully go on and do larger trials, and maybe this will be a future standard of care. I mean, the hope here is twofold. One, that maybe you can cure a small group of men with lutetium PSMA alone. Because right. we know you can cure men with external beam radiation. Right. So this is kind of future well, that vision. Would, that would dramatically reduce the side effects of the operation. The operations are not side effect free, right? Yeah. Now, that's a pretty radical thought, uh, and it would be hard to prove that because you need to do some large trials, but hopefully we'll see it at some point in time. Does it make surgery easier because it's shrinking it or does it actually make it easier? Uh, potentially in a few patients, but generally I think the surgeons are pretty confident in their ability to do surgery. So the other thought here the is surgeons that... Surgeons are always confident in their surgeons ability. Surgeons are generally pretty confident <laughs> in their ability. Yeah. But if you take this group of men that were in the study with high-risk localised prostate cancer that have surgery with curative intent, around 40% of those men subsequently have tumour recurrence. Right. So despite the confidence, we're going in there to try to cure you, there's a failure rate of about 40%, which is pretty high. So it's the pretty... other hope would be if we use it in combination, can we increase that cure rate? Can we eradicate some of the microscopic disease yep. that the surgeons can't see and can't deal with? Uh, and maybe as a combination treatment with surgery, you could increase cure rates. Or maybe as a combination with external beam. Uh, or as a combination of the second dose? Yes. Yeah. So there's all sorts of combinations to sort of try to take forwards off the back of this uh, study. Uh, 
So we hope to see lots of groups come up with different protocols about how to right and a prospective measured trial to go forward in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of taking it into general practice, right? Absolutely. Right. Because there was another one that I looked at, which was um, uh, another slightly I thought crazy good <laughs> was the way I would describe it. it was using. Uh, Orange electrons, it's called Violet. Well, tell us a little bit about that. So the Violet trial uh, is named after John Violet. John Violet was, he was a radiation oncologist who worked at Peter Mac, uh, who passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago, uh, unexpectedly. And uh, he had an interest in OJ electrons, which yes. is a very unusual interest. I think there's a biannual meeting where people with an interest in OJ electron therapy for humans come together, and he would attend that meeting. Uh, so, what well, are OJ electrons? Yes, well, I, I, I just you, maybe you can tell us. Well, I'm going to I'm going to tell you about that. But but my very first podcast back in 2005 was about attempting to do therapy in an animal model with OJ electrons. So I just thought I'd mention that. So it has been around a long time. The idea. So now you tell us about OJ electrons. I was going to say you're the you're the physicist <laughs> here. <laughs> Uh, but simplistically, and then you can tell us a bit more detail, I mean, we've got three main therapeutic options, beta, OJ, and alpha. Yes. And beta's well proven, radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer, lutetium-177. Uh, we've had some alpha therapies that have been approved, such as radium-223. Uh, and there's immense interest in actinium and, and lead-212. Uh, so there's trials underway of alpha emitters. But there have been very few I don't think there's any approved OJ electron therapies in humans. Uh, we have done some at Peter Mac. We used to give high dose indium 111 dotatate therapy for right. patients with neuroendocrine tumors before we had access to lutetium. Right. Uh, patients are treated with high dose indium 111. So many people would know indium as a gamma spect emitter, but it also emits uh, OJ electrons, as does gallium 67. Uh, so with industrial rather than imaging doses of these radioisotopes, we can potentially use them as therapy. So OJ electrons have a uh, much higher linear energy transfer than beta emitters, uh, somewhere between a beta and an alpha, uh, but an ultra short path length, even shorter than an alpha. So they travel less than the distance of a single cell, which is problematic because the effect of our therapies is through DNA damage. Right. So if it ends up somewhere in the cytoplasm, not close enough to the DNA, the OJ electron may not have any effect. Oh. Uh, so we need to either get it close to the nucleus so that it is within the range of DNA or stuck on the cell surface. There's some recent data that if you can target the cell surface and disrupt the cell membrane, that the cell will sort of implode right. uh, if you can damage that cell surface uh, enough. Uh, so you need particular isotopes that either stick to the cell surface or internalised and get close to the DNA. Uh, and the hope here is that we can target microscopic disease better. Right. This is a disadvantage with beta therapy, right. iodine or lutetium. They travel, let's say, one millimetre simplistically. So if we do a thought experiment, when we get down to the very last cell, the beta ray goes one millimetre and irradiates something nearby but doesn't kill off the last right. cell. And our impression is that patients that fail following lutetium therapy, you know, one mechanism of failure may be our inability to eradicate microscopic disease. Right. Uh, so the hope is alpha or beta or OJ therapy may overcome this limitation. Uh, so we were trying to pick an OJ emitter that was suitable for uh, prostate cancer therapy, and we stumbled across terbium-161. Uh, so this is a nice radioisotope to work with because it has, it's a, I think, radiometal similar to lutetium, so we can use a dota collator similar to what we do with lutetium. We can take our same targeting molecules and label them to terbium-161, and uh, we happen to work with a collaborator uh, who was starting to manufacture Terbium-161 for clinical use, right. uh, which is a company called Isotopia, based in Israel. Uh, so we thought, let's let's run a clinical trial of Terbium-161 
161 PSMA in men with prostate cancer. And uh, we had a grant from the US-based Prostate Cancer Foundation together with a collaborator who was willing to, to supply us with Terbium 161. So we put together the violet trial, small trial around 30 patients. And we're really trying to see firstly, is this, is this safe? Right. Are we going to get any unexpected toxicities? And what's the biodistribution compared to lutetium-177? Because when you change the radioactive label, you can change binding properties and get unexpected differences in biodistribution. And terbium-161 nicely emits a gamma oh. emission as well. So it's going to help. So we can image it. Uh, it's got a lower energy than lutetium. So at least in theory, it may not be as good for gamma imaging as lutetium. Uh, so we got this trial, you know, in uh, conception a couple of years ago and being a sort of first in human trial, it's taken a while to get up and running and we had all sorts of unexpected little things to solve along the way, like simple things like does our dose calibrator measure Terbium 161? No, it didn't. Did our SPECT camera, which, uh, you know, we've got a Siemens state-of-the-art spec CT with quantitative spec CT. So I thought, it, and it does out-of-the-box quantitative spec CT, and it's got a thing called XSpec yeah. Broad, which will do all the isotopes. I thought, this is fantastic. And it's got a very long list of isotopes. But not that one. But not Terbium-161, which was a little bit of a, of a surprise. Uh, so we had to, you know, do a lot of phantom work, uh, check our in-house quantitative spec CT, uh, or come up with an algorithm to do that. So a lot of basic interplay with our medical physics and radiochemists. We make these uh, molecules on site. Can we produce it reliably uh, with high quality control? Make sure the terbium doesn't dissociate. So we did all that well, groundwork. You'd, you'd worry about it dissociating because you've, you're going to have a have a lot of radiation. It's very close to the same molecule that's been producing. Correct. It, right? So you may get some radiolysis. Yes. Uh, so a lot of this groundwork was done and we treated the first patient, I'm trying to think, in, I think, November last year. Yep. And we, it's a dose escalation design, which means we treat three patients at a low, at a dose, and then we increase the rate, amount of radioactivity to another dose until we get to the highest dose level. In this study, we had three dose levels, I think starting at around four gigabecquerels, so sort of conservative low dose, make sure we don't have any unexpected side effects going up to 7.4 gigabecquerels of terbium. And pleasingly, we're at the highest dose level. I think we've treated the first 12 patients on this study as of today. Uh, so the study's going well. I think we're going to have a report maybe at the European Nuclear Medicine Meeting in Vienna about some of our early dosimetry data, normal right. organ dosimetry. Right, really hard to calculate dosimetry in this. But of course, one would imagine its dosimetry to healthy organs would be lower, right? Well, we think it should be maybe similar right. uh, because I forgot to mention, but terbium-161 is not a, it's not a OJ emitter exclusively. It also emits a beta. Right. So it emits a beta, an OJ and a gamma. And the beta is somewhat similar to lutetium-177. Uh, it's got a shorter half-life, uh, but a higher energy, the beta. Uh, overall, it's, it's similar. So we are going to, we're confident we'll get the, at least on basic principles, that we'll get similar beta effects to Lutetium-177 so that we won't compromise patient care. Right. It'll be equivalent. Then we'll get the added benefits of the OJ, which are harder to quantify. So when we talk about dosimetry with terbium, we're using post-therapy quantitative spec CT to do this. And mostly we're measuring the beta, right. not, not the OJ. Right. And we can do some extrapolations uh, from that. Right. And, and you're measuring things you can see. Correct. I mean, I mean if, you, if, you're, if you can't see it because you're, doing, you're trying to image those odd one cells, you can't see one cell in, a, in even the very best uh, uh, human PET scanner, although I would argue that you can see one cell uh, based on on what we saw last in our last podcast in our previous podcast, so but uh, but I think uh, I, I think uh, in a human PET scanner at the moment we can't see one cell, but in some animal and some tissue ones we can. Maybe in the future we'll be able to see one cell in a human PET scanner. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be super cool. But I think some fundamental science here has driven our desire to do this. So there's the PSI group in Switzerland that I've previously done a lot of work with. Terbium-161, and they have looked at some 
single cell multi carlo models comparing lutetium 177 to terbium and at least in the in their monte carlo modeling it's very clear that terbium ought to be superior for single cell eradication and there are some small animal experiments comparing lutetium to terbium as well uh, showing superior outcomes uh, in terms of tumor shrinkage and survival of of mice uh, using terbium compared to lutetium but humans are always quite different so yeah uh, when we transition from these monte carlo models to from mice to humans sometimes we get surprises yeah well in the brain world we found that pib doesn't work the the main brain, first brain tracer doesn't work on mice but it works on humans so we shouldn't be have too much reliability on our um on our animal models, but maybe our human tissue models might be a good place to look for this type of type of work, I think. Um, so is this stuff easy to produce? Can you make it in a reactor or whatever, or in a cyclotron, or how, how do you make this stuff? Yeah, so Terbium 161 production, it's similar to Lutetium 177. Uh, it's got some similarities. It's nuclear, it's made in a uh, reactor, so right. you need to bombard a compound. Uh, I'm trying to th remind myself of the parent compound to make terbium 161. I think it's a, I think it's a gadolinium. I think right. uh, so. It's, it's kind of like a, a rare earth metal, right. uh, which is hard to source. Right. So you put that in the nuclear reactor, bombard it, and essentially convert it into terbium 161. Uh, and then you have to do some purification steps. Uh, to, to take the terbium 161. So a lot of analogies to lutetium 177, right. a different starting compound. Yep. Uh, I think lutetium starts from, might be ebitrium, is yep. the parent Ibitrium, compound. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so very few places in the world currently making terbium 161. I think we also do need some alternatives to lutetium 177. Yep. Uh, we don't want to rely too much on a single uh, compound. Uh, so this is a really interesting study from just multiple aspects, from how do we measure terbium, yeah. how do we image it, uh, is it is it better, uh, and uh, maybe the birth of a you know whole new industry of terbium one six one because I think you could apply it to you know all the other treatments that we're already doing, right. your endocrine tumors uh, and beyond. Is it more effective? Uh, you know I think we need to do the clinical trials to have a look at that. We just don't right. know. And, and maybe it'll point to other ways we can use other Olger electron emitters like what, iodine-125? Yes, Y125 is another good OJ. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully in the next decade, we'll see a first approved OJ electron emitter in medicine because I don't think there's any approved agents to date. Right. It's not very often you get a whole sort of new class of approved no, no. tracer come along. Well, well, it's amazing. I mean, we've got the whole periodic table to look at in, in nuclear medicine, which is kind of cool. I mean, there isn't, it's, we're not just looking at pictures here, are we? Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's, and, and we see a whole lot of opportunities in this space, I think, you know, uh, treating early, like we did before, treating with different traces. And now we're getting a whole range, which we'll get to other podcasts coming up, but we've got, there's, there's combination therapies that deal with with uh, boosting the immune system to, to deal with, to, uh, using the therapies to do that and a whole lot of therapies for new types of cancers on the way too, you know, with HER2 cancers and all those sorts of things and renal cancers. So lots of stuff coming along. And it's been great to talk to you. We'll have to catch up with some more and, and some, of that, some of that other stuff. Great, great work. Is there anything else you'd like to mention about what we're doing, what you've done? Oh, just congratulations on running the, uh, I think, the longest... Nuclear medicine, maybe medical podcast, medical podcast on the planet, yes. on the uh, and planet. you're still keeping on keeping on going. So, yes. yeah, thanks for the invitation. And well, we it's... might have to get you on GU cast yeah. one day to soon have a combined. That'd be good. GU nukes cast. Maybe on maybe on dosimetry or something along those lines. Some hard things to do in the, in in that that combine what we do. Dosimetry. You talked about trials. We've got to measure stuff, and measuring stuff is a challenge in. In what we do, it's not an impossible challenge, though. So, so, um, so, yeah, we're absolutely. And, and thank you for for taking part in the podcast. And thanks for congratulating on the, on a long running podcast. It's I do it because I get to meet interesting people like you. That's why I do it. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> right, thanks again. Pleasure. Bye.